Chapter 17 Adam's old place is exactly as I remember it. Kenji and I sneak in from the underground parking garage and scale a few flights of stairs to the upper levels. I'm suddenly so nervous I can hardly speak. I've had to grieve the loss of my friends twice already, and part of me feels like this can't possibly be happening. But it must be. It has to be. I'm going to see Adam. I'm going to see Adam's face. He's going to be real. They blasted the door open when they were searching for us that first time, Kenji is saying. So the door is pretty jammed up. We'd been piling a bunch of furniture against it to keep it closed, but then it got stuck the other way, so yeah, it might take them a while to open it. But other than that, this little place has been good to us. Ken's still got a ton of food in storage, and all the plumbing still works because he'd paid for almost everything through the end of the year. All in all, we got pretty lucky, he says. I'm nodding my head, too afraid to open my mouth. That coffee from this morning suddenly doesn't feel very good in my stomach, and I'm jittery from head to toe. Adam. I'm about to see Adam. Kenji bangs on the door. Open up, he says. It's me. For a minute, all I hear is the sound of heavy movement, creaky wood, screechy metal, and a series of thuds. I watch the door frame as it shakes. Someone on the other side is yanking on the door, trying to get it unjammed. And then it opens. So slowly, I'm gripping my hands to keep myself steady. Winston is standing at the door, gaping at me. Holy shit, he says. He pulls his glasses off. I notice they've been taped together and blinks at me. His face is bruised and battered, his bottom lip swollen, split open. His left hand is bandaged, the gauze wrapped several times around the palm of his hand. I offer him a timid smile. Winston grabs a hold of Kenji's shirt and yanks him forward, eyes still focused on my face. Am I hallucinating again? He asks. Because I'm going to be so pissed if I'm hallucinating again. Damn it, he says, not waiting for Kenji to respond. If I had any idea how much it would suck to have a concussion, I'd have shot myself in the face when I had a chance. You're not hallucinating, Kenji cuts him off with a laugh. <laughs> now let us inside. Winston is still blinking at me, eyes wide as he backs away, giving us room to enter. But the minute I step over the threshold, I'm thrust into another world, a whole different set of memories. This is Adam's home, the first place I ever found sanctuary, the first place I ever felt safe. And now it's full of people, the space far too small to house so many large bodies, Castle and Brendan and Lily and Ian and Aaliyah and James, they've all frozen mid-movement, mid-sentence. They're all staring at me in disbelief. And I'm just about to say something. Just about to find something acceptable to say to my only group of battered, broken friends. When Adam walks out of the small room I know used to belong to James. He's holding something in his hands, distracted, not noticing the abrupt change in the atmosphere. Then he looks up. His lips are parted as if to speak, and whatever he was holding hits the ground, shattering into so many sounds it startles everyone back to life. Adam is staring at me, eyes locked on my face, his chest heaving, his face fighting so many different emotions. He looks half terrified, half hopeful, or maybe terrified to be hopeful. And though I realize I should probably be the first to speak, I suddenly have no idea what to say. Kenji pulls up beside me, his face splitting into a huge smile. He slips his arm around my shoulder, squeezes, says, Looky what I found. Adam begins to move across the room, but it feels strange, like everything has begun to slow down, like this moment isn't real somehow. There is so much pain in his eyes. I feel like I've been punched in the gut. But then there he is, right in front of me, his hands searching my body as if to ensure that I'm real, that I'm still intact. He's studying my face, my features, his fingers weaving into my hair, and then all at once he seems to accept that I'm not a ghost, not a nightmare, 
and he hauls me against himself so quickly I can't help but gasp in response. Juliet, he breathes. His heart is beating hard against my ear, his arms wrapped tight around me, and I melt into his embrace, relishing the warm comfort, the familiarity of his body, his scent, his skin. My hands reach around him, slip up his back, and grip him hard, and I don't even realize silent tears have fallen down my face until he pulls back to look me in the eye. He tells me not to cry tells me it's okay, that everything is going to be okay, and I know it's all a lie, but it still feels so good to hear. He's studying my face again, his hands carefully cradling the back of my head, so careful not to touch my skin. The reminder sends a sharp pain through my heart. I can't believe you're really here, he says, his voice breaking. I can't believe this is actually happening. Kenji clears his throat. Hey, guys, your loin passion is grossing out the little ones. I'm not a little one, James says, visibly offended. And I don't think it's gross. Kenji spins around. You're not bothered by all the heavy breathing going on over here? He makes a haphazard gesture toward us. I jump away from Adam reflexively. No, James says, crossing his arms. Are you? Mm, disgust with my general reaction, yeah. I bet you wouldn't think it was gross if it was you. A long pause. You make a good point, Kenji finally says. Maybe you should find me a lady in this crappy sector. I'm okay with anyone between the ages of 18 and 35, he points at James. So how about you get on that, thanks. James seems to take the challenge a little too seriously. He nods several times. Okay, he says. Uh, how about Aaliyah or Lily, he says, immediately pointing out the only other women in the room. Kenji's mouth opens and closes a few times before he says, Yeah, no thanks, kid. These two are like my sisters. So smooth, Lily says to Kenji, and I realize it's the first time I've really heard her speak. I bet you win over all the eligible women by telling them they're like sisters to you. I bet the ladies are just lining up to jump into bed with your punk ass. Rude, Kenji crosses his arms. James is laughing. You see what I have to deal with, Kenji says to him. There is no love for Kenji. I give and I give and I give and I get nothing in return. I need a woman who will appreciate all of this, he says gesturing to the length of his body. He's clearly over-exaggerating, hoping to entertain James with his ridiculousness, and his efforts are appreciated. Kenji is probably their only chance for comedic relief in this cramped space, and it makes me wonder if that's why he sets off on his own every day. Maybe he needs time to grieve in silence, in a place where no one expects him to be the funny one. My heart starts and stops as I hesitate, wondering at how hard it must be for Kenji to keep it together even when he wants to fall apart. I caught a glimpse of that side of him for the first time today, and it surprised me more than it should have. Adam squeezes my shoulder, and I turn to face him. He smiles a tender, tortured smile, his eyes heavy with pain and joy. But of all the things I could be feeling right now, guilt hits me the hardest. Everyone in this room is carrying such heavy burdens. Brief moments of levity puncture the general gloom shrouding this space. But as soon as the jokes subside, the grief slides back into place. And though I know I should grieve for the lives lost, I don't know how. They were all strangers to me. I was only just beginning to develop a relationship with Sonia and Sarah. But when I look around, I see that I'm alone in feeling this way. I see the lines of loss creasing my friends' faces. I see the sadness buried in their clothes, perched atop their furrowed brows, and something in the back of my mind is nagging at me, disappointed in me, telling me I should be one of them, that I should be just as defeated as they are. But I'm not. I can't be that girl anymore. For so many years, I lived in constant terror of myself. Doubt had married my fear and moved into my mind, where it built castles and ruled kingdoms and reigned over me. 
bowing my will to its whispers until I was little more than an acquiescing peon, too terrified to disobey, too terrified to disagree. I had been shackled, a prisoner in my own mind. But finally, finally, I have learned to break free. I am upset for our losses. I'm horrified. But I'm also anxious and restless. Sonia and Sarah are still alive, living at the mercy of Anderson. They still need our help. So I don't know how to be sad when all I feel is an unrelenting determination to do something. I am no longer afraid of fear, and I will not let it rule me. Fear will learn to fear me. Chapter 18 Adam leads me toward the couch, but Kenji intercepts us. You guys can have your moment, I promise, he says. But right now, we all need to get on the same page. Say hello and how are you and whatever, whatever, and we need to do it fast. Juliet has information everyone needs to hear. Adam looks from Kenji to me. What's going on? I turn to Kenji. What are you talking about? He rolls his eyes at me, looks away, and says, Have a seat, Kent. Adam backs away, just an inch or two, his curiosity winning out for the moment, and Kenji tugs me forward so I'm standing in the middle of this tiny room. Everyone is staring at me like I might pull turnips out of my pants. Kenji, what? Aaliyah, you remember Juliet? Kenji says, nodding at a slim blonde girl sitting in a back corner of the room. She offers me a quick smile before looking away, blushing for no apparent reason. I remember her. She's the one who designed my custom knuckle braces, the intricate pieces I'd worn over my gloves both times we went out to battle. I'd never really paid close attention to her before, and I now realize it's because she tries to be invisible. She's a soft, sweet-looking girl with gentle brown eyes. She also happens to be an exceptional designer. I wonder how she developed her skill. Lily, you definitely remember Juliet, Kenji is saying to her. We all broke into the storage compounds together? He glances at me. You remember, right? I nod, grin at Lily. I don't really know her, but I like her energy. She mock salutes me, smiling wide as her springy brown curls fall into her face. Nice to see you again, she says. And thanks for not being dead. It sucks being the only girl around here. Aaliyah's blonde head pops up for only a second before she retreats deeper into the corner. Sorry, Lily says, looking only slightly remorseful. I meant the only talking girl around here. Please tell me you talk, she says to me. Oh, she talks, Kenji says, shooting me a look. Cusses like a sailor, too. I do not cuss like a... Brendan, Winston, Kenji cuts me off, pointing at the two guys sitting on the couch. These two definitely don't require an introduction, but as you can see, he says, they look a little different now. Behold, the transformative powers of being held hostage by a bunch of sadistic bastards. He flourishes a hand in their direction, his sarcasm accompanied by a brittle smile. Now they look like a pair of wildebeests, but you know, by comparison... I look like a damn king, so it's good news all around. Winston points at my face. His eyes are a little unfocused, and he has to blink a few times before saying, I, I, I like you. It's pretty nice you're not dead. I second that, mate. Brendan claps Winston on the shoulder, but he's smiling at me. His eyes are still so very light blue, and his hair so very white blonde but he has a huge gash running from his right temple down to his jawline, and it looks like it's only just beginning to scab up. I can't imagine where else he's hurt. What else Anderson must have done to both him and Winston, a sick, slithery feeling moves through me. It's so good to see you again, Brendan is saying, his British accent always surprising me. Sorry we couldn't be a bit more presentable. I offer them both a smile. I'm so happy you're all right. Ian, Kenji says, gesturing to the tall, lanky guy perched on the arm of the couch. Ian Sanchez, 
I remember him as a guy on my assembly team when we broke into the storage compound. But more important, I know him to be one of the four guys who were kidnapped by Anderson's men. He, Winston, Brendan, and another guy named Emery. We'd managed to get Ian and Emery back, but not Brendan and Winston. I remember Kenji saying that Ian and Emery were so messed up when we brought them in that even with the girls helping to heal them, it'd still taken them a while to recover. Ian looks okay to me now, but he too must have undergone some horrific things. And Emery clearly isn't here. I swallow hard, offering Ian what I'm hoping is a strong smile. He doesn't smile back. How are you still alive? He demands, with no preamble. You don't look like anyone beat the shit out of you, so I mean, no offense or whatever, but I don't trust you. We're getting to that part, Kenji says, cutting Adam off just as he begins to protest on my behalf. She has a solid explanation, I promise. I already know all the details. He shoots Ian a sharp look, but Ian doesn't seem to notice. He's still staring at me, one eyebrow raised as if in challenge. I cock my head at him, considering him closely. Kenji snaps his fingers in front of my face. Focus, princess. I'm already getting bored. He glances around the room looking for anyone we might have missed for the reintroductions. James, he says, his eyes landing on the upturned face of my only ten-year-old friend. Anything you want to say to Juliet before we get started? James looks at me, his blue eyes bright below his sandy blonde hair. He shrugs. I never thought you were dead, he says simply. Is that right? Kenji says with a laugh. James nods. I had a feeling, he says, tapping his head. Kenji grins. All right, well, that's it. Let's get started. What about cat? I begin to say, but stop dead at the flicker of alarm that flits in and out of Kenji's features. My gaze lands on Castle, studying his face in a way I hadn't when I first arrived. Castle's eyes are unfocused, his eyebrows furrowed as if he's caught in an endlessly frustrating conversation with himself. His hands are knotted together in his lap. His hair has broken free of its always perfect ponytail at the nape of his neck, and his dreads have sprung around his face, falling into his eyes. He's unshaven and looks as though he's been dragged through the mud, as though he sat down in that chair the moment he walked in and hasn't left it since. And I realize that of the group of us, Castle has been hit the hardest. Omega Point was his life. His dreams were in every brick, every echo of that space, and in one night, he lost everything. His hopes, his vision for the future, the entire community he strove to build, his only family, gone. He's had it really rough, Adam whispers to me, and I'm startled by his presence, not realizing he was standing beside me again. Castle's been like that for a little while now. My heart breaks. I try to meet Kenji's eyes, try to apologize wordlessly to tell him I understand, but Kenji won't look at me. It takes him a few moments to pull himself together, and only then does it hit me just how hard all of this must be for him right now. It's not just Omega Point. It's not just everyone he's lost. Not just all the work that's been destroyed. It's Castle. Castle, who's been like a father to Kenji, his closest confidant, his dearest friend. He's become a husk of who he was. My heart feels weighed down by the depth of Kenji's pain. I wish so much that I could do something to help, to fix things. And in that moment, I promise myself I will. I'll do everything I can. All right. Kenji claps his hands together, nods a few times before taking a tight breath. Everyone all warm and fuzzy? Good, good. He nods again. Now, let me tell you the story of how our friend Juliet was shot in the chest. Chapter 19 Everyone is gaping at me. Kenji has just finished giving them every detail I shared with him, taking care to leave out the parts about Warner telling me he loves me, and I'm silently grateful. 
Even though I told Adam that he and I shouldn't be together anymore, everything between us is still so raw and unresolved. I've tried to move on, to distance myself from him because I wanted to protect him. But I've had to mourn Adam's loss in so many different ways now that I'm not sure I even know how to feel anymore. I have no idea what he thinks of me. There are so many things Adam and I need to talk about. I just don't want Warner to be one of them. Warner has always been a tense topic between us, especially now that Adam knows they're brothers, and I'm not in the mood for arguing, especially not on my first day back. But it seems I won't be able to get off that easily. Warner saved your life? Lily asks, not bothering to hide her shock or her repulsion. Even Aaliyah is sitting up and paying attention now, her eyes glued to my face. Why the hell would he do that? Dude, forget that, Ian cuts in. What are we going to do about the fact that Warner can just steal our powers and shit? You don't have any powers, Winston answers him, so you don't have anything to worry about. You know what I mean, Ian snaps, a hint of color flushing up his neck. It's not safe for a psycho like him to have that kind of ability. It freaks me the hell out. He's not a psych, I try to say, but the room erupts into a cacophony of voices, all vying for a chance to be heard. What does that even mean? Dangerous? So Sonia and Sarah are still alive. Actually saw Anderson? What'd he look like? But why would he even... Okay, but that's not... Wait. Adam cuts everyone off. Where the hell is he now? He turns to look me in the eye. You said Warner brought you out here to show you what happened to Omega Point, but then the minute Kenji shows up, he just disappears. A pause. Right? I nod. So what? He says. He's done? He's just walking away. Adam spins around, looks at everyone. Guys. He knows that at least one of us is still alive. He's probably gone to get back up, to find a way to take the rest of us out. He stops, shakes his head hard. Shit, he says under his breath. Shit. Everyone freezes at the same time, horrified. No, I say quickly, holding up both hands. No, he's not going to do that. Eight pairs of eyes turn on me. He doesn't care about killing you guys. He doesn't even like the reestablishment, and he hates his father. What are you talking about? Adam cuts me off, alarmed. Warner is an animal. I take a steadying breath. I need to remember how little they know Warner, how little they've heard from his point of view. I have to remind myself what I used to think of him just a few days ago. Warner's revelations are still so recent, I don't know how to properly defend him or how to reconcile these polarizing impressions of him, and for a moment it makes me furious with him and his stupid pretenses, forever having put me in this position. If only he didn't come across as a sick, twisted psycho, I wouldn't have to stand up for him right now. He wants to take down the reestablishment, I try to explain. And he wants to kill Anderson, too. The room explodes into more arguments, shouts, and epithets that all boil down to no one believing me. Everyone thinking I'm insane and that Warner's brainwashed me. They think he's a proven murderer who locked me up and tried to use me to torture people. And they're not wrong. Except that they are. I want so desperately to tell them they don't understand. None of them know the truth, and they're not giving me a chance to explain. But just as I'm about to say something else in my own defense, I catch a glimpse of Ian out of the corner of my eye. He's laughing at me. Out loud, slapping his knee, head thrown back, howling with glee at what he thinks is my stupidity. And for a moment, I seriously begin to doubt myself and everything Warner said to me. I squeeze my eyes shut. How will I ever really know if I can trust him? How do I know he wasn't lying to me like he always did, like he claims he has been from the beginning? I'm so sick of this uncertainty, so sick and tired of it. But I blink, and I'm being pulled out of the crowd, tugged toward James's bedroom door to the storage closet that used to be his room. Adam pulls me inside and shuts the door on the insanity behind us. 
He's holding my arms, looking into my eyes with a strange, burning intensity that startles me. I'm trapped. What's going on? He asks. Why are you defending Warner? After everything he did to you, you should hate him. You should be furious. I can't, Adam. I... What do you mean you can't? I just... It, it's not that easy anymore. I shake my head, try to explain the unexplainable. I don't know what to think of him now. There are so many things I misunderstood, things I couldn't comprehend. I drop my eyes. He's really... I hesitate, conflicted. I don't know how to tell the truth without sounding like a liar. I don't know, I finally say, staring into my hands. I don't know, he's just... He's not as bad as I thought. Wow. Adam exhales, shocked. He's not as bad as you thought? He's not as bad as you thought? How on earth could he be any better than you thought? Adam. What the hell are you thinking, Juliet? I look up. He can't hide the disgust in his eyes. I panic. I need to find a way to explain, to present an irrefutable example, proof that Warner is not who I thought he was. But I can already tell that Adam has lost confidence in me, that he doesn't trust me or believe me anymore, and I flounder. He opens his mouth to speak. I beat him to it. Do you remember that day you found me crying in the shower, after Warner forced me to torture that toddler? Adam hesitates before nodding, slowly, reluctantly. That was one of the reasons I hated him so much. I thought he'd actually put a child in that room. That he'd stolen someone's kid and wanted to watch me torture it. It was just so despicable. I say, so disgusting, so horrifying. I thought he was inhuman, completely evil, but it wasn't real, I whisper. Adam looks confused. It was just a simulation, I try to explain. Warner told me it was a simulation chamber, not a torture room. He said it all happened in my imagination. Juliet, Adam says, sighs. He looks away, looks back at me. What are you talking about? Of course it was a simulation. What? Adam laughs a small, confused sort of laugh. You knew it wasn't real? I ask. He stares at me. But when you found me, you said it wasn't my fault. You told me you'd heard about what happened and that it wasn't my fault. Adam runs a hand through the hair at the back of his neck. I thought you were upset about breaking down that wall, he says. I mean, I knew the simulation would probably be scary as hell, but I thought Warner would have told you what it was beforehand. I had no idea you'd walked into something like that thinking it was going to be real. He presses his eyes shut for a second. I thought you were upset about learning you had this whole new crazy ability and about the soldiers who were injured in the aftermath. I'm blinking at him, stunned. All this time, a small part of me was still holding on to doubt, believing that maybe the torture chamber was real and that Warner was just lying to me. Again. But now? To have confirmation from Adam himself? I'm floored. Adam is shaking his head. That bastard, he's saying. I can't believe he did that to you. I lower my eyes. Warner's done a lot of crazy things, I say. But he really thought he was helping me. But he wasn't helping you, Adam says, angry again. He was torturing you. No, that's not true. I focus my eyes on a crack in the wall. In some strange way, he did help me. I hesitate before meeting Adam's gaze. The moment in the simulation chamber was the first time I ever allowed myself to be angry. I never knew how much more I could do, that I could be so physically strong until that moment. I look away, clasp and unclasp my hands. Warner puts up this facade. I'm saying, 
He acts like he's a sick, heartless monster, but he's... I don't know. I trail off, my eyes trained on something I can't quite see. A memory, maybe, of Warner smiling, his gentle hands wiping away my tears. It's okay, you're okay, he'd said to me. He's really... I don't, um... Adam breaks away, blows out a strange, shaky breath. I don't know how I'm supposed to understand this. He says, looking unsteady. You, what, you, you like him now? You're friends with him? The same guy who tried to kill me? He's barely able to conceal the pain in his voice. He had me hung from a conveyor belt in a slaughterhouse, Juliet. Or have you already forgotten that? I flinch, drop my head in shame. I had forgotten about that. I'd forgotten that Warner almost killed Adam, that he'd shot Adam right in front of my face. He saw Adam as a traitor, as a soldier who'd held a gun to the back of his head, defied him and stole me away. It makes me sick. I'm just, I'm so confused, I finally managed to say. I want to hate him, but I just don't know how anymore. Adam is staring at me like he has no idea who I am. I need to talk about something else. What's going on with Castle? I ask. Is he sick? Adam hesitates before answering, realizing that I'm trying to change the subject. Finally, he relents, sighs. It's bad, he says to me. He's been hit worse than the rest of us. And Castle, taking it all so hard, has really affected Kenji. I study Adam's face as he speaks, unable to stop myself from searching for similarities to Anderson and Warner. He doesn't really leave that chair, Adam is saying. He sits there all day until he collapses from exhaustion, and even then he just falls asleep sitting in the same spot. Then he wakes up the next morning and does the same thing again, all day. He only eats when we force him to and only moves to go to the bathroom. Adam shakes his head. We're all hoping he'll snap out of it pretty soon, but it's been really weird to just lose a leader like that. Castle was in charge of everything, and now he doesn't seem to care about anything. He's probably still in shock, I say, remembering it's only been three days since the battle. Hopefully with time, I tell him. He'll be all right. Yeah, Adam says, nods, studies his hands. But we really need to figure out what we're going to do. I don't know how much longer we can live like this. We're going to run out of food in a few weeks at the most. He says, we've got 10 people to feed now. Plus, Brendan and Winston are still hurting. I've done what I can for them using the limited supplies I have here, but they need actual medical attention and pain medication if we can swing it. A pause. I don't know what Kenji's told you, but they were seriously messed up when we brought them in here. Winston's swelling has only just gone down. We really can't stay here for much longer, he says. We need a plan. Yes. I'm so relieved to hear he's ready to be proactive. Yes, yes, we need a plan. What are you thinking? Do you already have something in mind? Adam shakes his head. I don't know. He admits. Maybe we can keep breaking into the storage units like we used to. Steal supplies every once in a while. And lie low in a bigger space on unregulated ground. But we'll never be able to set foot on the compounds. He says. There's too much risk. They'll shoot us dead on sight if we're caught, so I don't know. He says. He looks sheepish as he laughs. I'm kind of hoping I'm not the only one with ideas. But I hesitate, confused. That's it? You're not thinking of fighting back anymore? You think we should just find a way to live? Like this? I gesture to the door to what lies beyond it. Adam looks at me, surprised by my reaction. It's not like I want this, he says. But I can't see how we could possibly fight back without getting ourselves killed. I'm trying to be practical. He runs an agitated hand through his hair. I took a chance, 
he says, lowering his voice. I tried to fight back, and it got us all massacred. I shouldn't even be alive right now. But for some crazy reason, I am. And so is James. And God, Juliet, so are you. And I don't know, he says, shaking his head, looking away. I feel like I've been given a chance to live my life. I'll need to think of new ways to find food and put a roof over my head. I have no money coming in. I'll never be able to enlist in this sector again, and I'm not a registered citizen, so I'll never be able to work. Right now, all I'm focused on is how I'll be able to feed my family and my friends in a few weeks. His jaw tenses. Maybe one day, another group will be smarter, stronger. But I don't think that's us anymore. I don't think we stand a chance. I'm blinking at him, stunned. I can't believe this. You can't believe what? You're giving up. I hear the accusation in my voice, and I do nothing to hide it. You're just giving up? What choice do I have? He asks, his eyes hurt, angry. I'm not trying to be a martyr, he says. We gave it a shot. We tried to fight back, and it came to shit. Everyone we know is dead, and that battered group of people you saw out there is all that's left of our resistance. How are the nine of us supposed to fight the world? He demands. It's not a fair fight, Juliet. I'm nodding, staring into my hands, trying and failing to hide my shock. I'm not a coward, he says to me, struggling to moderate his voice. I just want to protect my family. I don't want James to have to worry that I'm going to show up dead every day. He needs me to be rational. But living like this... I say to him, as fugitives, stealing to survive and hiding from the world. How is that any better? You'll be worried every single day, constantly looking over your shoulder, terrified of ever leaving James alone. You'll be miserable. But I'll be alive. That's not being alive, I say to him. That's not living. How would you know? He snaps. His mood shifts so suddenly I'm stunned into silence. What do you know about being alive? He demands. You wouldn't say a word when I first found you. You were afraid of your own shadow. You were so consumed by grief and guilt that you'd gone almost completely insane, living so far inside your own head that you had no idea what happened to the world while you were gone. I flinch, stung by the venom in his voice. I've never seen Adam so bitter or cruel. This isn't the Adam I know. I want him to stop, rewind, apologize, erase the things he's just said. But he doesn't. You think you've had it hard? He's saying to me. Living in psych wards and being thrown in jail? You think that was difficult. But what you don't realize is that you've always had a roof over your head and food delivered to you on a regular basis. His hands are clenching, unclenching. And that's more than most people will ever have. You have no idea what it's really like to live out here. No idea what it's like to starve and watch your family die in front of you. You have no idea, he says to me, what it means to truly suffer. Sometimes I think you live in some fantasy land where everyone survives an optimism. But it doesn't work that way out here. In this world, you're either alive, about to die, or dead. There's no romance in it, no illusion. So don't try to pretend you have any idea what it means to be alive today, right now, because you don't. Words, I think, are such unpredictable creatures. No gun, no sword, no army or king will ever be more powerful than a sentence. Swords may cut and kill. But words will stab and stay, burying themselves in our bones to become corpses we carry into the future, all the time digging and failing to rip their skeletons from our flesh. I swallow hard. One, two, three, and steady myself to respond quietly, carefully. 
He's just upset, I'm telling myself. He's just scared and worried and stressed out, and he doesn't mean any of it. Not really, I keep telling myself. He's just upset. He doesn't mean it. Maybe, I say. Maybe you're right. Maybe I don't know what it's like to live. Maybe I'm still not human enough to know more than what's right in front of me. I stare straight into his eyes. But I do know what it's like to hide from the world. I know what it's like to live as though I don't exist, caged away and isolated from society. And I won't do it again, I say. I can't. I've finally gotten to a point in my life where I'm not afraid to speak, where my shadow no longer haunts me, and I don't want to lose that freedom. Not again. I can't go backward. I'd rather be shot dead screaming for justice than die alone in a prison of my own making. Adam looks toward the wall, laughs, looks back at me. Are you even hearing yourself right now? He asks. You're telling me you want to jump in front of a bunch of soldiers and tell them how much you hate the reestablishment just to prove a point? Just so they can kill you before your 18th birthday? That doesn't make any sense, he says. It doesn't serve anything. And this doesn't sound like you, he says, shaking his head. I thought you wanted to live on your own. You never wanted to be caught up in war. You just wanted to be free of Warner and the asylum and your crazy parents. I thought you'd be happy to be done with all the fighting. What are you talking about, I say. I've always said I wanted to fight back. I've said it from the beginning, from the moment I told you I wanted to escape when we were on base. This is me, I insist. This is how I feel. It's the same way I've always felt. No, he says. No, we didn't leave base to start a war. We left to get the hell away from the reestablishment, to resist in our own way, but most of all to find a life together. But then Kenji showed up and took us to Omega Point and everything changed, and we decided to fight back because it seemed like it might actually work, because it seemed like we might actually have a chance. But now? He looks around the room at the closed door. What do we have left? We're all half dead, he says. We are eight poorly armed men and women and one ten-year-old boy trying to fight entire armies. It's just not feasible, he says. And if I'm going to die, I don't want it to be for a stupid reason. If I go to war, if I risk my life, it's going to be because the odds are in my favor, not otherwise. I don't think it's stupid to fight for humanity. You have no idea what you're saying. He snaps, his jaw tensing. There's nothing we can do. There's always something, Adam. There has to be. Because I won't live like this anymore. Not ever again. Juliet, please. He says, his words desperate all of a sudden, anguished. I don't want you to get killed. I don't want to lose you again. This isn't about you, Adam. I feel terrible saying it, but he has to understand. You're so important to me. You have loved me, and you were there for me when no one else was. I never want you to think I don't care about you, because I do, I tell him. But this decision has nothing to do with you. It's about me, I tell him. And this life point to the door. The life on the other side of that wall? That's not what I want. My words only seem to upset him more. Then you'd rather be dead? He asks, angry again. Is that what you're saying? You'd rather be dead than try to build a life with me here? I would rather be dead, I say to him, inching away from his outstretched hand then go back to being silent and suffocated. And Adam is just about to respond. He's parting his lips to speak when the sounds of chaos reach us from the other side of the wall. We share one panicked look before yanking the bedroom door open and rushing into the living room. My heart stops, starts, stops again. 
Warner is here. Chapter 20 He's standing at the front door, hands shoved casually in his pockets, no fewer than six different guns pointed at his face. My mind is racing as it tries to process what to do next, how best to proceed, but Warner's face changes seasons as I enter the room. The cold line of his mouth blossoms into a bright smile. His eyes shine as he grins at me, not seeming to mind or even notice the many lethal weapons aimed in his direction. I can't help but wonder how he found me. I begin to move forward, but Adam grabs my arm. I turn around, wondering at my sudden irritation with him. I'm almost irritated with myself for being irritated with him. This is not how I imagined it would be to see Adam again. I don't want it to be this way. I want to start over. What are you doing? Adam says to me. Don't go near him. I stare at his hand on my arm, look up to meet his gaze. Adam doesn't budge. Let go of me, I say to him. His face clears all of a sudden, like he's startled somehow. He looks down at his hand, releases me without a word. I put as much space between us as I can, the whole time scanning the room for Kenji. His sharp black eyes meet mine immediately and he raises one eyebrow. His head is cocked to the side, the twitch of his lips telling me the next move is mine and I'd better make it count. I part my way through my friends until I'm standing in front of Warner, facing my friends and their guns and hoping they won't fire at me instead. I make an effort to sound calm. Please. I say, don't shoot him. And why the hell not? Ian demands, his grip tightening around his gun. Julia, love. Warner says, leaning into my ear. His voice is still loud enough for everyone to hear. I do appreciate you defending me, but really, I'm quite able to handle the situation. It's eight against one, I say to him, forgetting my fear in the temptation to roll my eyes. They've all got guns pointed at your face. I'm pretty sure you need my interference. I hear him laugh behind me, just once. Just before every gun in the room is yanked out of every hand and thrown up against the ceiling. I spin around in shock, catching a glimpse of the astonishment on every face behind me. Why do you always hesitate? Warner asks, shaking his head as he glances around the room. Shoot if you want to shoot. Don't waste my time with theatrics. How the hell did you do that? Ian demands. Warner says nothing. He tugs off his gloves carefully, pulling at each finger before slipping them off his hands. It's okay, I tell him. They already know. Warner looks up, raises an eyebrow at me, smiles a little. Do they really? Yes, I told them. Warner's smile changes into something almost self-mocking as he turns away, his eyes laughing as he contemplates the ceiling. Finally, he nods at Castle, who's staring at the commotion with a vaguely displeased expression. I borrowed, Warner says to Ian, from present company. Hot damn, Ian breathes. What do you want? Lily asks, fists clenched, standing in a far corner of the room. Nothing from you, Warner says to her. I'm here to pick up Juliet. I have no wish to disturb your slumber party, he says, looking around at the pillows and blankets piled on the living room floor. Adam goes rigid with alarm. What are you talking about? She's not going anywhere with you. Warner scratches the back of his head. Do you never get exhausted being so wholly unbearable? You have as much charisma as the rotting innards of unidentified roadkill. I hear an abrupt wheezing noise, and I turn toward the sound. Kenji has a hand pressed to his mouth, desperately trying to suppress a smile. He's shaking his head, holding up a hand in apology, and then he breaks, laughing out loud, snorting as he tries to muffle the sound. I'm sorry, he says, pressing his lips together, shaking his head again. This is not a funny moment. It's not. I'm not laughing. Adam looks like he might punch Kenji in the face. So you don't want to kill us, Winston says. 
Because if you're not going to kill us, you should probably get the hell out of here before we kill you first. No, Warner says calmly. I am not going to kill you. And though I wouldn't mind disposing of these two, he nods at Adam and Kenji. The idea is little more than exhausting to me now. I am no longer interested in your sad, pathetic lives. I am only here to accompany and transport Juliet safely home. She and I have urgent matters to attend to. No, I hear James say suddenly. He clamors to his feet, stares Warner straight in the eye. This is her home now. You can't take her away. I don't want anyone to hurt her. Warner's eyebrows fly up in surprise. He seems genuinely startled, as though he's only now noticing the ten-year-old. Warner and James have never actually met before. Neither one of them knows their brothers. I look at Kenji. He looks back. This is a big moment. Warner studies James's face with rapt fascination. He bends down on one knee, meets James at eye level. And who are you? He asks. Everyone in the room is silent, watching. James blinks steadily and doesn't answer right away. He finally shoves his hands into his pockets and stares at the floor. I'm James, Adam's brother. Who are you? Warner tilts his head a little. No one of consequence, he says. He tries to smile. But it's very nice to meet you, James. I'm pleased to see your concern for Juliet's safety. You should know, however, that I have no intention of hurting her. It's just that she's made me a promise, and I intend to see it through. What kind of promise? James asks. Yeah, what kind of promise? Kenji cuts in, his voice loud and angry all of a sudden. I look up, look around. Everyone is staring at me, waiting for me to answer. Adam's eyes are wide with horror and disbelief. I meet Warner's gaze. I'm not leaving, I tell him. I never promised I would stay on base with you. He frowns. You'd rather stay here? He asks. Why? I need my friends, I tell him, and they need me. Besides, we're all going to have to work together, so we may as well get started now. And I don't want to have to be smuggled in and out of base, I add. You can just meet me here. Whoa, wait, what do you mean we can all work together? Ian interrupts. And why are you inviting him to come back here? What the hell are you guys talking about? What kind of promise did you make him, Juliet? Adam's voice is loud and accusing. I turn toward the group of them, me standing beside Warner, facing Adam's angry eyes along with the confused, soon-to-be-angry faces of my friends. Oh, how strange all of this has become in such a short period of time. I take a tight, bracing breath. I'm ready to fight, I say, addressing the entire group. I know some of you might feel defeated, some of you might think there's no hope left, especially not after what happened to Omega Point. But Sonia and Sarah are still out there, and they need our help. So does the rest of the world. And I haven't come this far just to turn back now. I'm ready to take action, and Warner has offered to help me. I look directly at Kenji. I've accepted his offer. I've promised to be his ally, to fight by his side, to kill Anderson, and to take down the reestablishment. Kenji narrows his eyes at me, and I can't tell if he's angry or if he's really, really angry. I look at the rest of my friends. But we can all work together, I say. I've been thinking about this a lot. I go on, and I think the group of us still has a chance, especially if we combine our strengths with Warner's. He knows things about the reestablishment and his father that we'd never be able to know otherwise. I swallow hard as I take in the shocked, horrified looks on the faces of those around me. But, I hurry to say, if you aren't interested in fighting back anymore, I totally understand. And if you'd rather I didn't stay here among you, I would respect your decision. Either way, I've already made my choice, I tell them. 
Whether or not you choose to join me, I've decided to fight. I will take down the reestablishment, or I will die trying. There's nothing left for me otherwise. Chapter 21 The room is quiet for a long time. I've dropped my eyes, too afraid to see the looks on their faces. Aaliyah is the first to speak. I'll fight with you, she says, her soft voice ringing strong and confident in the silence. I look up to meet her eyes and she smiles, her cheeks flushed with color and determination. But before I even have a chance to respond, Winston jumps in. Me too, he says. As soon as my head stops hurting, but yeah, me too. I've got nothing left to lose, he says with a shrug. And I'll kick some ass just to get the girls back, even if we can't save the rest of the world. Same, Brendan says, nodding at me. I'm in too. Ian is shaking his head. How the hell can we trust this guy, he asks. How do we know he's not full of shit? Yeah, Lily pipes up. This doesn't feel right. She focuses her eyes on Warner. Why would you want to help any of us? She asks him. Since when have you ever been trustworthy? Warner runs a hand through his hair, smiles unkindly, glances at me. He's not amused. I am not trustworthy, Warner finally says, looking up to meet Lily's eyes. And I have no interest in helping you, he says. In fact, I think I was very clear just a moment ago when I said that I was here for Juliet. I did not sign up to help her friends, and I will make zero guarantees for your survival or your safety. So if you're seeking reassurance, he says, I can and will offer you none. Ian is actually smiling. Lily looks a little mollified. Kenji is shaking his head. All right. Ian nods. That's cool. He rubs his forehead. So what's the game plan? Have you all lost your minds? Adam explodes. Are you forgetting who you're talking to? He just busts down our door and demands to take Juliet away, and you want to stand by his side and fight with him? The same guy who's responsible for destroying Omega Point? He says. Everyone is dead because of him. I am not responsible for that, Warner says sharply, his expression darkening. That was not my call, nor did I have any idea it was happening. By the time I broke out of Omega Point and found my way back to base, my father's plans were already underway. I was not a part of the battle, nor was I a part of the assault on Omega Point. It's true, Lily says. The Supreme is the one who ordered the airstrike against Omega Point. Yeah, and as much as I hate this guy by default, Winston adds, jerking a thumb at Warner. I hate his father a whole hell of a lot more. He's the one who kidnapped us. It, it was his men who held us captive, not the soldiers of Sector 45. So yeah, Winston says, stretching back on the couch. I'd love to watch the Supreme die a slow, miserable death. I have to admit, Brendan says, I'm not often keen on revenge, but it does sound very sweet right now. I want to watch that bastard bleed, Ian says. How nice that we all have something in common, Warner mutters, irritated. He sighs, looks at me. Juliet, a word, please? This is bullshit, Adam shouts. He looks around. How can you all so easily forget yourselves? How can you forget what he's done, what he did to me, what he did to Kenji? Adam pivots to face me then. How can you even look at him, he says to me, knowing how he treated us. He nearly murdered me, leaving me to bleed out slowly so he could take his time torturing me to death. Kent, man, please, you need to calm down, okay? Kenji steps forward. I understand that you're pissed. I'm not happy about this either, but things get crazy in the aftermath of war. Alliances form in unlikely ways, he shrugs. If this is the only way to take Anderson out, 
maybe we should consider... I can't believe this. Adam cuts him off, looking around. I can't believe this is happening. You've all lost your minds. You're all insane, he says, gripping the back of his head. This guy is a psycho. He's a murderer. Adam, I try to say, please, what's happened to you? He turns on me. I don't even know who you are anymore. I thought you were dead. I thought he'd killed you, he says, pointing at Warner. And now you're standing here, teaming up with the guy who tried to ruin your life. Talking about fighting back because you have nothing left to live for. What about me? He demands. What about our relationship? When did that stop being enough for you? This isn't about us, I try to tell him. Please, Adam, let me explain. I have to get out of here, he says, abruptly moving toward the door. I can't be here right now. I can't process all of this in one day. It's too much, he says. It's too much for me. Adam. I catch his arm in one last attempt, one last effort to try and talk to him, but he breaks away. All of this, he says, meeting my eyes, his voice quieting to a raw, aching whisper. Was for you. I left everything I knew because I thought we were in this together. I thought it was going to be me and you. His eyes are so dark, so deep, so hurt. Looking at him makes me want to curl up and die. What are you doing? He says, desperate now. What are you thinking? And I realize he actually wants an answer. Because he waits. He stands there and he waits, waits to hear my response while everyone watches us, likely entertained by the spectacle we've made. I can't believe he's doing this to me, here, right now, in front of everyone, in front of Warner. I try to meet Adam's eyes, but find I can't hold his gaze for very long. I don't want to live in fear anymore, I say, hoping I sound stronger than I feel. I have to fight back, I tell him. I thought we wanted the same things. No, I wanted you, he says, struggling to keep his voice steady. That's all I wanted. From the very beginning, Juliet, you were it. You were all I wanted. And I can't speak. I can't speak. I can't cough up the words because I can't break his heart like this. But he's waiting. He's waiting and he's looking at me and I need more, I choke out. I wanted you too, Adam, but I need more than that. I need to be free. Please try to understand. Stop. Adam explodes. Stop trying to get me to understand a bunch of bullshit. I can't deal with you anymore. And then he grabs the jacket sitting on the sofa, hauls the door open, and slams it shut behind him. There's a moment of absolute silence. I try to run after him. Kenji catches me around the waist, yanks me backward, gives me a hard, knowing look. I'll take care of Kent. You stay here and clean up the mess you made, he says, cocking his head at Warner. I swallow hard, don't say a word. It's only after Kenji has disappeared that I turn around to face the remaining members of our audience, and I'm still searching for the right thing to say when I hear the one voice I least expected. Ah, Miss Ferrars, Castle says. It's so good to have you back. Things are always so much more entertaining when you're around. Ian bursts into tears. Chapter 22 Everyone crowds around Castle at once. James practically tackles him. Ian shoves everyone else out of the way in his attempt to get closer. Castle is smiling, laughing a little. He finally looks more like the man I remember. I'm all right, he's saying. He sounds exhausted as if the words are costing him a great deal to get out. Thank you so much for your concern, but I'll be all right. 
I just need a little more time, that's all. I meet his eyes. I'm afraid to approach him. Please, Castle says to Aaliyah and Winston, the two standing closest on either side of him. Help me up. I'd like to greet our newest visitor. He's not talking about me. Castle gets to his feet with some difficulty. Even with everyone scrambling to help him, the entire room suddenly feels different, lighter, happier somehow. I hadn't realized how much of everyone's grief was tied up in Castle's well-being. Mr. Warner, Castle says, locking eyes with him from across the room. How very nice of you to join us. I'm not joining anything. I always knew you would, Castle says. He smiles a little. And I am pleased. Warner seems to be trying not to roll his eyes. You may let the guns down now, Castle says to him. I promise I will watch them closely in your absence. We all glance up at the ceiling. I hear Warner sigh. All at once, the guns float to the floor, settling gently onto the carpet. Very good, Castle says. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'm in desperate need of a long shower. I hope you won't mistake my early exit for rudeness, he adds. It's only that I feel quite certain we'll be seeing a lot of each other in these next weeks. Horner's jaw tenses by way of response. Castle smiles. Winston and Brendan help Castle to the bathroom, while Ian shouts eagerly about grabbing him a change of clothes. Me, Warner, James, Aaliyah, and Lily are the only ones left in the room. Juliet, Warner says. I glance in his direction. A moment of your time, please, in private. I hesitate. You can use my room, James interjects. I don't mind. I look at him, shocked he'd offer up his personal space so freely to the likes of me and Warner, especially after having seen his brother's outburst just now. Adam will be okay, James says to me, as if reading my mind. He's just really stressed out. He's worried about a lot of things. He thinks we're going to run out of food and stuff. James, it's really okay, James says. I'll hang out with Aaliyah and Lily. I glance at the two girls, but their faces reveal nothing. Aaliyah offers me only the slightest of sympathetic smiles. Lily is staring at Warner, sizing him up. I finally sigh, relenting. I follow Warner into the small storage closet, closing the door behind me. He doesn't waste any time. Why are you inviting your friends to join us? I told you I didn't want to work with them. How did you find me? I counter. I never pressed the button on the pager you gave me. Warner studies my eyes, his sharp green gaze locked onto mine as if trying to read me for clues. But the intensity of his gaze is always too much for me. I break the connection too soon, feeling untethered somehow. It was simple deductive reasoning, he finally says. Kent was the only member of your group with a life outside of Omega Point. His old home was the only place they'd have been able to retreat to without causing a disturbance. And as such, Werner says, it was the first place I checked. A slight shake of his head. Contrary to what you might believe, love, I am not an idiot. I never thought you were an idiot, I say, surprised. I thought you were crazy, I tell him, but not an idiot. I hesitate. I actually think you're brilliant, I confess. I wish I could think like you. I look away and look back at him too quickly, feeling a lot like I need to learn to keep my mouth shut. Warner's face clears, his eyes crinkle in amusement as he smiles. I don't want your friends on my team, he says. I don't like them. I don't care. They will only slow us down. They will give us an advantage, I insist. I know you don't think they did things the right way at Omega Point, but they did know how to survive. They all have important strengths. They're completely broken. They're grieving, I tell him, annoyed. 
Don't underestimate them. Castle is a natural leader, I say. Kenji is a genius and an excellent fighter. He acts like an idiot sometimes, but you know better than anyone else that it's just a show. He's smarter than all of us. Plus, Winston and Aaliyah can design anything we need as long as they have the materials. Lily has an incredible photographic memory. Brendan can handle electricity, and Winston can stretch his limbs into just about anything. And Ian? I falter. Well, Ian is good for something, I'm sure. Warner laughs a little, his smile softening until it disappears altogether. His features settle into an uncertain expression. And Kent? Warner finally asks. I feel my face pale. What about him? What is he good for? I hesitate before answering. Adam is a great soldier. Is that all? My heart is pounding so hard. Too hard. Warner looks away, carefully neutralizes his expression, his tone. You care for him. It's not a question. Yes, I manage to say. Of course I do. And what does that entail, exactly? I don't know what you mean, I lie. Warner is staring at the wall, holding himself very still, his eyes revealing nothing of what he's really thinking, what he's feeling. Do you love him? I'm stunned. I can't even imagine what it must cost him to ask this question so directly. I almost admire him for being brave enough to do it. But for the first time, I'm not really sure what to say. If this were one week ago, two weeks ago, I would have answered without hesitation. I would have known, definitely, that I loved Adam, and I wouldn't have been afraid to say so. But now I can't help but wonder if I even know what love is— if what I felt for Adam was love, or just a mix of deep affection and physical attraction. Because if I loved him, if I really, truly loved him, would I hesitate now? Would I so easily be able to detach myself from his life, his pain? I've worried so much about Adam these past weeks, the effects of his training, the news of his father, but I don't know if it's been out of love or if it's been out of guilt. He left everything for me, because he wanted to be with me. But as much as it pains me to admit it, I know I didn't run away to be with him. Adam wasn't my main reason. He wasn't the driving force. I ran away from me, because I wanted to be free. Juliet? Werner's soft whisper brings me back to the present hauls me up and into myself, jarring my consciousness back to reality. I'm afraid to dwell on the truths I've just uncovered. I meet Warner's eyes. Yes? Do you love him? He asks again, more quietly this time. And I suddenly have to force myself to say three words I never, ever thought I'd say. I don't know. Warner closes his eyes. He exhales, the tension clear in his shoulders and in the line of his jaw, and when he finally looks at me again, there are stories in his eyes, thoughts and feelings and whispers of things I've never even seen before, truths he might never bring himself to say, impossible things and unbelievable things, and an abundance of feeling I've never thought him capable of. His whole body seems to relax in relief. I don't know this boy standing before me. He's a perfect stranger, an entirely different being, the type of person I might never have known if my parents hadn't tossed me away. Juliet, he whispers. I'm only now realizing just how close he is. I could press my face against his neck if I wanted to, could place my hands on his chest if I wanted to, if I wanted to. I'd really love for you to come back with me, he says. I can't, I say to him, heart racing suddenly. I have to stay here. But it's not practical, 
he says. We need to plan. We need to talk strategy. It could take days. I already have a plan. His eyebrows fly up and I tilt my head, fixing him with a hard look before I reach for the door. Chapter 23 Kenji is waiting on the other side. What the hell do you two think you're doing, he says. Get your asses out here right now. I head straight into the living room, eager to put distance between me and whatever keeps happening to my head when Warner gets too close. I need air. I need a new brain. I need to jump out of a window and catch a ride with a dragon to a world far from here. But the moment I look up and try to steady myself, I find Adam staring at me, blinking like he's starting to see something he wishes he could unsee. And I feel my face flush so fast that for a moment I'm surprised I'm not standing in a toilet. Adam? I hear myself say. No, it's not. I can't even talk to you right now. He's shaking his head, his voice strangled. I can't even be near you right now. Please, I try to say. We were just talking. You were just talking? Alone? In my brother's bedroom? He's holding his jacket in his hands. He tosses it onto the couch, laughs like he might be losing his mind, runs a hand through his hair and glances up at the ceiling, stares back at me. What the hell is going on, Juliet? He asks, his jaw tensing. What is happening right now? Can we talk about this in private? No. His chest is heaving. I want to talk about this right now. I don't care who hears it. My eyes immediately go to Warner. He's leaning against the wall just outside James's room, arms crossed loosely at his chest. He's watching Adam with a calm, focused interest. Warner stills suddenly, as if he can feel my eyes on him. He looks up, looks at me for exactly two seconds before turning away. He seems to be laughing. Why do you keep looking at him? Adam demands, eyes flashing. Why are you even looking at him at all? Why are you so interested in some demented psycho? I'm so tired of this. I'm tired of all the secrets and all my inner turmoil and all the guilt and confusion I felt over these two brothers. More than anything else, I don't like this angry Adam in front of me. I try to talk to him and he won't listen to me. I try to reason with him and he attacks me. I try to be honest with him and he won't believe me. I have no idea what else to do. What's really going on between you guys? Adam is still asking me. What's really happening, Juliet? I need you to stop lying to me. Adam! I cut him off. I'm surprised by how calm I sound. There's so much we need to be discussing right now, I say to him. And this isn't it. Our personal problems don't need to be shared with everyone. So you admit it then, he says, somehow angrier. That we have problems, that something is wrong. Something's been wrong for a while, I say, exasperated. I can't even talk to you. Yeah, ever since we dragged this asshole back to Omega Point. Adam says. He turns to glare at Kenji. It was your idea. Hey, don't pull me into your bullshit, okay? Kenji counters. Don't blame me for your issues. We were fine until she started spending so much goddamn time with him, Adam begins to say. She spent just as much time with him while we were still on base, genius. Stop, I say. Please understand, Warner is here to help us. He wants to take down the reestablishment and kill the Supreme just like we do. He's not our enemy anymore. He's going to help us? Adam asks, eyes wide, feigning surprise. Oh, you mean just like he helped us the last time he said he was going to fight on our side, right before he broke out of Omega Point and bailed? Adam laughs out loud, disbelieving. I can't believe you're falling for all of his bullshit. This isn't some kind of trick, Adam. I'm not stupid. Are you sure? What? I can't believe he just insulted me. I asked you if you were sure. He snaps. 
because you're acting pretty damn stupid right now, so I don't know if I can trust your judgment anymore. What is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? He shouts back, eyes blazing. You don't do this. You don't act like this, he says. You're like a completely different person. Me? I demand, my voice rising. I've been trying so hard to control my temper, but I just don't think I can anymore. He says he wants to have this conversation in front of everyone. Fine. We'll have this conversation in front of everyone. If I've changed, I say to him, then so have you. Because the Adam I remember is kind and gentle, and he'd never insult me like this. I know things have been rough for you lately, and I'm trying to understand, to be patient, to give you space. But these last few weeks have been rough on all of us. We're all going through a hard time, but we don't put each other down. We don't hurt each other. But you can't even be nice to Kenji, I tell him. You used to be friends with Kenji, remember? Now every time he so much as cracks a joke, you look at him like you want to kill him, and I don't know why. You're going to defend everyone in this room except for me, aren't you? Adam says. You love Kenji so much. You spend all your goddamn time with Kenji. He's my friend. I'm your boyfriend. No, I tell him. You're not. Adam is shaking, fists clenched. I can't even believe you right now. We broke up, Adam. My voice is steady. We broke up a month ago. Right, Adam says. We broke up because you said you loved me. Because you said you didn't want to hurt me. I don't, I tell him. I don't want to hurt you. I've never wanted to hurt you. What the hell do you think you're doing right now? He shouts. I don't know how to talk to you, I tell him, shaking my head. I don't understand. No, you don't understand anything, he snaps. You don't understand me, you don't understand yourself, and you don't understand that you're acting like a stupid child who's allowed herself to be brainwashed by a psychopath. Time seems to stand still. Everything I want to say and everything I've wished to say begins to take shape, falling to the floor and scrambling upright. Paragraphs and paragraphs begin building walls around me, blocking and justifying as they find ways to fit together, linking and weaving and leaving no room for escape. And every single space between every unspoken word clamors up and into my open mouth, down my throat and into my chest, filling me with so much emptiness, I think I might just float away. I'm breathing. So hard. A throat clears. Yes, right. I'm really sorry to interrupt, Warner says, stepping forward. But Juliet, I need to get going. Are you sure you want to stay here? I freeze. Get out, Adam shouts. Get the hell out of my house, you piece of shit, and don't come back here. Well, Warner says, cocking his head at me. Never mind. It looks like you don't really have a choice. He holds out his hand. Shall we? You're not taking her anywhere. Adam turns on him. She's not leaving with you, and she's not partnering up with you. Now get lost. Adam, stop. My voice is angrier than I mean it to be, but I can't help it anymore. I don't need your permission. I'm not going to live like this. I'm not hiding anymore. You don't have to come with me. You don't even have to understand, I tell him. But if you loved me, you wouldn't stand in my way. Warner is smiling. Adam notices. Is there something you want to say? Adam turns on him. God, no, Warner says. Juliet doesn't require my assistance, and you might not have realized it yet, but it's obvious to everyone else that you've lost this fight, Kent. Adam snaps. He charges forward, fist pulled back and ready to swing, and it all happens so quickly I only have time to gasp before I hear a sharp crack. 
Adam's fist is frozen only inches from Warner's face. It's caught in Warner's hand. Adam is shocked into silence, his whole body shaking from the unspent energy. Warner leans into his brother's face, whispers, You really don't want to fight me, you idiot, and hurls Adam's fist back with so much force that Adam flies backward, catching himself just before hitting the floor. Adam is up, bolting across the room, angrier. Kenji tackles him. Adam is shouting for Kenji to let him go, to stop getting involved, and Kenji is yanking Adam across the room against his will. He somehow manages to haul open the front door and pulls himself and Adam outside. The door slams shut behind them.